Welcome, um, Pastor Andy. It's an honor to be jumping in here for Pastor Dave so that he can get a last second family vacation. He's got two in college now, so you know how hard that is to get their schedules to match. So this was it. Um, last week, I had the privilege of preaching up in uh, Lantana, and it's exciting to see that congregation as the summer is ending and the fall is beginning. Uh, the numbers are climbing up again. Uh, what a wonderful group of people. I urge you to go up there and uh, see what they're up to as well and provide your support. But I, I gave an overview of the life of Elijah, and uh, I just, personally, I enjoyed it. I, don't, I can't tell you what they thought all about it. Uh, I think they liked it, but I thought, I really wanted to do the same thing for Elisha. These are some interesting people in our Bible past, and it's really interesting to kind of look at them, not just from the one axe head floating perspective, but the whole range of their ministry, and, and honestly, bringing back to mind some of the incredible things God did in our past through all sorts of people, all sorts of people, ordinary, regular people, that he's done incredible things through, like you and me. Elisha is the uh, person who receives the handoff of the prophetic job or task at this time in the life of the people of God. And as you know, prophets are a necessary counterbalance to the power of the kings. And we're looking at first and second kings. We see again and again that the power that the kings get goes to their head. And instead of worshiping the God that has given them all power, they begin to see themselves as all powerful. And as a result, they stray, they lead their kingdoms to disaster. That won't get better. That will continue through the end of Second Kings, unfortunately, all the way through until Israel is destroyed entirely. The kings will be the culprits for that destruction, leading the people away from God. But the prophets keep trying and trying to lead them back. Elijah, whose name means God is Yahweh, Elijah, he tries to, to, to show them through the power that God gives him of the, that our God is the only God. This, again, is unusual because they, they came to the land of milk and honey, the promised land, and found out there were a lot of gods already there, a lot of gods being worshipped. And so Elijah's ministry is one of continuing to say there is only one God, and that is the only one to worship. Um, that is a problem in our time today. We worship many small G gods to remember again and again that there's only one God, Elijah. God is Yahweh. God is the Lord. It's a task for preachers and for leaders and for each of us to continue to struggle with one God. There are so many things we could worship, but God is the only one worthy of our worship Elisha means God is salvation. Shalom. Elisha. Elisha. Eli God. Sha. Shalom. God is salvation. God is peace. God is wholeness. God is um, life, and as we would say, life eternal. There is no other source for that than this God. Elisha takes over for Elijah in, in a very humble way. Uh, Elijah's ready to leave in a very dramatic fashion. says, what can I do for you, Elisha, before I leave? He says, let me inherit the double portion. The double portion is the symbol for what the oldest son gets. Elisha is saying, let me stay behind as your oldest son. What a beautiful thought. And, and, and Elijah gives him that double portion and is then uh, taken away in a chariot of fire. Da, 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 da. Elijah is one of only two that receive such treatment. Enoch and Elijah don't die first. They pass jail and go right to heaven. 
Even Jesus has to die, doesn't he? But not Elijah and Enoch. You can ask God when you get there why, but that's his, his deal. And in this moment, we see what an incredibly awesome God we have. And this is a, a gift to Elisha, this dramatic uh, exit to heaven. You know, Elijah is known for fire, bringing the fire down on the sacrifice against the prophets of Baal, uh, bringing the fire down on the companies of soldiers who have come to capture him, and here bringing the fire down to lift him back up. What a way to go. And as he lifts him up, I'm reminded of, of the awesome God we have. At this very moment, we have an incredibly awesome God at the very top of Mount Baker, in Washington, where some of the ladies of the Freedom Challenge are now making their last steps to the top for their summit. They left at 2 in the morning, below 40 degrees, raining. After having slept in tents for two nights, they are making their way to the top as we sit here. And each one of them is doing it for a very, very important reason. Never in the history of mankind have we had more people in human slavery than we do right now. And that's wrong. And they are climbing so that they can shout from the highest mountaintop, Jesus means freedom. Jesus means freedom. They could be here suntanning on the beaches, they could be anywhere relaxing, but instead right now they are miserable and tired and maybe even afraid. But that's where they want to be because that's what brings them close to the people who are miserable, terrible, and afraid, caught in human trafficking. They are in solidarity. They are in unity with them. And they are doing it in the name of God. Our God is an awesome God. An awesome God that can inspire people to do what those ladies are doing now, to do what we never think we're capable of doing, to struggle and strive for the good things, the right things. Elijah is rewarded for his struggle. He is lifted up. And Elisha's eyes are lifted up. And eyes, our eyes can be lifted up today too, to the top of Mount Baker, and even higher to the awesome God who inspires us to take up the cause, whatever cause God is calling us to for his people, his children. So Elijah's dramatic exit points to the power of God once again, his incredible, awesome nature. Elisha leaves that scene for some more pedestrian, more, one could say, even trivial circumstances, which brings us uh, to Pastor Dave's stories uh, that he wanted to highlight today. Uh, Alicia apparently is follically challenged. Follically, anybody else follically challenged here? Balding? As he's walking away from this awesome moment, he's got these young boys, they're taunting him, calling him Baldy, 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 hey Baldy. Okay, so maybe Elisha overreacts a little when he sends two bears after them to maul them. <laughs> maybe, maybe he's overreacting a little. People come to him and say, hey, listen, um, the water in our town is undrinkable. Flint has been having a problem for 2,000 years, apparently, or more. He goes and throws some salt into the water. In the name of the Lord, it's cleansed. We heard the story of the, of the chopping down of the, of the poles and the axe said that flies off. Has anybody ever had that happen? It's happened to me before. It was borrowed. I love that. It was borrowed. I never lend my tools. Do you lend your tools? No. 
and I never borrow. Don't, don't even offer. My wife's like, why won't you borrow tools? I says, because the minute I borrow them, they'll break, and then I have to buy them new tools for their piece of junk that I borrowed. You laugh, it's happened. Men do not, most men will not put themselves in that situation. I won't say that for sure. Frankly, would you borrow a frying pan from a neighbor? Eh. <laughs> Seems like kind of small stuff after a chariot of fire, an axe head, uh, mauling bears, uh, salt in the water. Um, I think that the point is that God is with Elisha, even in the small stuff, the little stuff. Quite honestly, the trivial we could have done without stuff. But then what's more trivial than a baby born in a manger in Bethlehem? Hmm? What's more trivial than the little acts of kindness that we're asked to, to do in our lives every day, maybe even this morning? What's more trivial than a few things a church in Boca Raton may have done over the weekend? And yet it's in those small things that God shows himself again and again. Justice, healing, and preventing one an incredibly embarrassing circumstance of not being able to return an axe head. Alicia continues with some other astounding stories, each of them a form uh, other impressions of both his ministry and the kind of God that he serves. In the next uh, story, he is part of the general that is fighting against the people of God, and this is happening all the time in this promised land, threatens to attack God's people. Elisha is called in for help. The river between the armies turns blood red. That is enough to scare away the other army. And it reminds us, doesn't it, of something that happened not that long ago for the people of God. We were doing vacation Bible school a couple of weeks ago, and we were talking about the plagues. And I was struggling to think about how do you talk about the plagues to the little kids. And I said, you know what? These are all warnings. All warnings about how powerful God is. And if you cross God willingly, here's the price you'll pay. The sea turning red is a reminder of when the Nile River was turned red. Part of the reason why the people of God were eventually set free. God is faithful. He did it then. He did it for Elisha again to remind the people of their past. And, and he will keep doing it. He will keep being faithful to us. He's been praying a lot for a million refugees in the southern tip of Bangladesh. A million refugees in the last three years, a million people have fled Myanmar, formerly Burma. A million have fled for their lives. They have not fled for economic reasons because they have fled to a place with no economy. They have fled to what is essentially a wasteland. The only reason they've gone is because it's not safe to be home anymore. Their villages have been systematically attacked. It's a religious and national issue. Myanmar is run by Buddhist nationalists. And unless you think that Buddhism is only about om and peace, all religions can go the wrong way. They've attacked the Muslim, long-time Rohingya people who've lived in that area, and they have fled for their lives. There is a million of them, and I've had the privilege and the horror of walking through one of their camps and seeing people who left with the clothes on their backs trying to make a life for themselves in shacks that are piled one on top of another as far, and I'm not kidding, 
as the eye can see. Susan and I stood up on top of the hill and looked, and we could not see the end of the camp in any direction. One million people. What can you do for one million people? Well, one thing for sure, you can make sure that you pray to God for them. And we're so excited that the ministry we're involved with that is indeed the reason Dina from our church is climbing today is going to be putting in a ministry and one of the first Christian ministries in that camp. It's going to be remarkable. It will be a drop in the ocean, but it will be a drop of God's mercy and grace for the children and families who are there. God can change the water to blood. He can change a sea, an ocean of refugees into people with hope. Elisha continues his ministry in touching ways, literally touching, touching a a young boy who has died and bringing him back to life. Touching a man who is a faithful man of God, afflicted with leprosy, and making him clean again. Aren't we in need of that touch today? That touch of healing. That touch that brings something that no medicine or doctor or treatment can bring. I fully believe and am grateful to God for all that medicine can do. But I think we all know it's not enough. We need healing here. Indeed, we need that more than anything else. They've said many times, we will not all be cured when we turn to God, but we will all be healed when we turn to God. Alicia shares a God of healing in a powerful way. And as a pastor, every once in a while, I get invited to share that power of healing in a powerful way. A while back, I was called to go to a hospital room late at night. A young couple had prematurely delivered a child stillborn. And they asked if I could baptize that baby. Can you imagine my drive over? I don't know these people at all. I don't know how they're going to be when I walk in the room. How might you be when a minister of God walks into the room and you're gazing at the tiny little figure of the baby that never got to be? How do you think you might feel about God at that moment? I wasn't sure if I should be ready to duck or not when I walked in the room. It would be so easy for them to blame God, wouldn't it? Blame God. And I could hardly blame them if they did. But I walked into that room and was astounded to be greeted with three sets of smiles. The mother's smile. I thought, well, maybe she's being polite. The father's smile. That was the one I was more worried about. Because when you are grieving, who knows where that will take you in emotions. And then the smile, the biggest of all, the nurse. The nurse who had to be with them through that whole process. We washed that baby in the waters of holy baptism and said aloud what was always true, God has your child and he'll never let go. They have a long way of grieving ahead. And that baby is with God and not with them. But I feel that by the grace of God, some healing took place. A little. A start. What a blessing that we can be because of the God we have, the God of healing. Today we are going to be blessing our teachers as they get started on a year. Um, Anybody been a teacher? Anybody still a teacher? 
I don't know if there's a harder job. Hmm? I mean, really. And, and, and the few times that I've taught, I've thought about how exhausting it really is and how you can really um, be just um, trying to get to the bell for the class to finish for one hour and, and how you can just be trying to get to the end of the day, trying to get to the end of the week, trying to get to the end of the semester. And even as they start today, there will be some of them thinking, how will I make it to the end of the year? People of God were experiencing a famine in Elisha's time. The oil was running out. We've heard this story before in Elisha's stories as well. The oil was running out. Elisha said, everybody get your empty jugs together. We got one that's got a little bit left in it. We're going to start pouring and see how we can share it. And they poured and they poured and they poured and they poured and they found out something incredible. All of the jars were full when they were done because that's the way God works. I've often heard people say what a great thing it is when someone can see that a glass is not half empty, but half full. Christians see the glass running over. We see it running over. Our friends don't. Our kids don't. But we do. We see the glass no matter what is going on in our lives, and we say God is going to overflow it. God is going to come into this situation, this sickness, this confusion, this relationship, this problem, and God is going to pour so much in that we will be embarrassed by the mess of blessings he makes. Alicia shows us that. God's blessings overthrowing. I picked this theme uh, months ago because I was, I'm um, sorry to say, a Game of Thrones fan. Um, it turned out very few of you were. My wife has pointed out that maybe it wasn't the best show for a pastor to, to watch, so forgive me for that. I admit there's some, yeah. It was really cool, though. Our chair back here. Anybody that didn't see the first 15 minutes of the batter of Winterfell, I don't even know. You don't know what you're missing. 15 minutes of sheer anxiety as the good people are waiting in the castle to be attacked by the bad people. I'll just keep it real simple. And as they looked out there, they wondered, every character wondered, What's going to be the outcome of this battle? Most of them, quite certain, they would not see the end of it alive. Elisha's gathered with uh, another general, and the army is looking out at those who are ready to attack. It's interesting these uh, generals bring the prophets on board at the last second for good luck, I think. The general's basically saying, we are in trouble. We are outnumbered, completely outnumbered. Look, Elisha, this is a disaster. He says, Op open your eyes. And then, to the surprise of the general, he sees. He sees out there all the enemies. But then surrounding all the enemies, the hosts of the armies of God. Only seen by eyes of faith. Only seen by those who trust that God is with us in every battle. Look, he says, those who are with us are more than those who are against us. Those who are with us are more than those who are against us. What a powerful message for us today as we face incredible challenges personally, as a country, as a world. Challenges that seem far beyond our ability 
to meet. But we're told through this story, God is with us. And those who are with us are greater than those who are against us. God is victorious in that battle and every battle. Dina's going to make it to the top. Our teachers are going to make it to the end of the year, most of them. The Rohingyas in faraway Bangladesh will be blessed. Friends will receive healing. Jars will be filled to the overflowing. Because that's the kind of God we have. And that is what salvation is. Do not think you must wait till heaven for salvation. Alicia tells us salvation is here. Amen.